In scripture, we find a famous story about a man, a man who becomes a hunter and a hunter who becomes a king. As king, he goes around building cities and the most famous of these cities we know to be Babel. The name of this king, Nimrod. Hello and welcome again to the Faith and Fringe podcast. I'm your host, Kirk Whitmire, and this is episode eight, Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, which kind of sounds like an Indiana Jones title, if I'm being honest, but it just kind of is what it is. It's one of the most famous stories in scripture and one that many of us who grew up in church heard in Sunday school or in sermons, and it's something that's pretty familiar to most of us. It goes hand in hand with the flood narrative and Noah and everything that happens there. So the Tower of Babel follows immediately after that. and It's a story that most of us are familiar with, but if you're not, it's a very interesting one and something that we're going to dive into today. Now, going into this episode, you know, it's kind of funny to me. If you run in these circles, like the fringe circles like I do, especially the the biblical ones, the prophecy ones, uh, there's a lot that surrounds this particular story. You know, even outside of church and scripture and those, man, the History Channel, Ancient Aliens, all these things somehow find a way to tie themselves back to Nimrod. Now, if those things sound completely out there to you and you've never heard any of those things, it's pretty wild, right? So when you try to go into a subject like this from an academic, biblical standpoint, and you even try to do research, things just become really difficult and get bogged down really quick and the waters get very muddy. And people are very passionate about this tale, actually, on the church side and secular side and anything in between, because a lot of people, it's rooted in a lot of the things that they believe and they preach. You know, because this is one of those, well, it's in Genesis, right? And it has these elements to it that play out throughout scripture. And so it's, it's this point in the narrative that I felt like we had to stop and address. I I almost kind of was going to go by it right now and not really get into this because it's such a deep story, but it really just falls in line with this series that we have going on. That's kind of building this framework for how we're going to view scripture and kind of things that we will reference. So if we're going to be existing or dovetailing in to the fringe (laughs) things at all on this show, you, I have to kind of address this and give us a foundation for this particular topic and how it falls into everything else we've already talked about. So if you listen to last week's episode, you know that we've kind of been dealing with the Nephilim, that story and the judgment and the flood. And this event kind of takes place right after it. But there's something I want to touch on real quick before we get into it. I kind of want to give you a little bit of the background of Nimrod and where he comes from, because this story is only just a couple of chapters after the flood. But I think it's really important and worth kind of making a stop along the way to talk about some events that happened right after the flood with Noah and his sons, because I think this story particularly impacts Nimrod and his family and where he comes from. So before we get into the story of the Tower of Babel, let's go back a little bit into Genesis. We're going to pick up the story in chapter 7, verse 21. And it says this, All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth, and all mankind, of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth. And only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. And the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. There's just a little interesting thing that I kind of want to notate here, because people talk about how did the Nephilim return and all these things. And there's many options and things that we could kind of talk about and dive in, maybe on another episode. But I do find it interesting in these verses, some of the terminology that gets used here, things like mankind, uh, everything on the dry land, everything in who was the breath of the spirit of life died. You know, those maybe could be some interesting distinguishing factors, because if we're talking about things that are being spawned unnaturally and against the creative order of God, You can make an argument that those things don't have the breath of life in them because they were illegitimate. I don't know. It's just something interesting to think about. And I like to kind of meditate and just kind of ponder those things a little bit. 
And it's these kind of things that, again, jump off the page to me when I look at them. I'm not saying it's what it is. I just think it's an interesting thing to consider. All right, let's just carry on. So let's hop ahead to Genesis chapter nine. That just kind of puts us, you know, the flood has subsided. That was chapter seven. We're going to skip ahead another chapter here. uh, And we're going to pick up in verse 18 of chapter nine. Again, we're in the NASB. Now, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the whole earth was populated. Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk, and he uncovered himself in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both of their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. He shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. So this event had massive implications, and there are a lot of debates that kind of surround what happened here. Um, And it's something that I want to kind of dive into a little bit while we're in this vicinity, because again, this is the lineage from which Nimrod will come, right? Because what we'll see in a little bit is that this is his grandfather that we would be talking about with Ham. So something that's really interesting in this, and you know, these these things are a little bit dicey that we're going to talk about. So just kind of prepare yourselves. We're, We're going to talk about some sexual things here for a second, because that's what the prevailing theory is. The first one, and I think the most censored version of this would be that he walked in, he saw his dad naked, and that was a sin. And that he walked out, he told his brothers that, hey, dad's in there naked, and I saw it. And that his brothers grab something, put it over their shoulders so they don't see. They walk in backwards and they kind of chunk, you know, the covering onto their dad and then they hurry out of the tent. Okay, that's, the like I said, the most censored version of this story. I don't think that that's the best interpretation of what's happening. Now, the next most defensible position about what's going on here is that this is actually paternal incest, right? That there is a sexual act that happens between Ham and his father, Noah. And the reason that they say this is because of the phrase, which is an idiom, which is to see his father's nakedness, right? So nakedness. No, I'm just kidding. So To understand this and what's going on and why people believe that, you have to kind of jump ahead to Leviticus, okay? So if we go to Leviticus 20, this will start to kind of bring context and help shed some light on this. So Leviticus 20, verse 17 says this, If a man takes his sister, a daughter of his father, or a daughter of his mother, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace. And they shall be cut off in the sight of the children of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness, and he shall bear his iniquity. And later on in verse 20 of the same chapter in Leviticus, it says this. I'm reading from the ESV here, guys. Sorry, I meant to say that kind of when I jumped into this. Uh, But a little bit of a switch. But you guys know if I go from NASB, I'll typically jump to the ESV. And that's where we are now. So again, sorry. Uh, Leviticus chapter 20 on down to verse 20 says, if a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin and they shall die childless. So here we see that verse 20 illustrates that a woman's nakedness would be considered the man's nakedness as well. Uh, And that's something that we're going to get into here in a little bit, because I think that sheds a little bit more light on kind of the context of what I think and other people think is happening in this situation here. But this idiom, so an idiom, if you guys aren't familiar with the term, is a phrase in a language that only really the people of that language would understand. Something that we would say in English would be two birds, one stone. Okay. If you didn't know the kind of the context of how that's used in our language, you know, it's like, Hey, well, you can do two things at once, right? It's not explained to you because you know how that idiom works. Something like this phrase to see or uncover someone's nakedness is an idiom of the Hebrew We see, though, in Leviticus, an important point that gets made here that 
seeing someone's nakedness and also uncovering someone's nakedness can both be a reference to a sexual act. So that's why it's kind of interpreted that what's happening in the tent is something sexual. But the question becomes, because that phrase can also refer to a woman, right? Because the idea in ancient culture, in the Hebrew culture, as we saw, is that if you do something sexual with a man's wife, it's also called uncovering father's nakedness. So to further illustrate that point, let's back up in Levitic, Leviticus a little bit to chapter 18. And I want you guys to take a look at verse 6 and 8 again in the ESV. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. So what we can see there is you also have to understand, and this is why the idiom comes into play and is really important because a lot of people will take the face value of this idiom to say, oh, he uncovered his father's nakedness. That uncovering of nakedness is relating to a sexual act. It's obviously something with Noah. But we see that there is nuance for sure at play here because it is possible that Noah passes out drunk in his tent. His mother is in there. Sorry, not Noah's mother, but Ham's mother, Noah's wife. And that Ham goes in there and does sexual things with his mother. Okay, it's and why do I think this? Why do I think there's this particular distinction of what's happening here? Well, it all has to do with the mention of Canaan, okay? Because if Ham goes into the tent with Noah and does this thing, one, why, okay? If, if you're just trying to say that it's a homosexual act, it's, you're really inferring that. And in, not really inferring, I, I get the, the idea of the idiom and the interpretation, but there's a little bit of inference saying that it's homosexual. The reason I don't think it's a homosexual act is because of how Canaan comes into play in all this. So if you'll notice, Something in particular, when these genealogies of Noah's sons get kind of laid out, the second that it mentions Ham, it in parentheses says the father of Canaan. So what do I think is going on here? Uh, and not just me. This is, this is a, another opinion held in scholarship. I think, and others think as well, what is happening here is that Ham, which is a younger brother, is going into the tent to take advantage of his mother whether she's drunk or not, we don't know. It just, it's, it's not said, okay? But what happens is he takes advantage and he impregnates his mother. And that illegitimate child is Canaan. And that is why when Noah, quote unquote, sees, which I think is realizing that his wife is pregnant, when he sees what Ham has done, he curses Canaan. And why does he curse Canaan in mentioning him with his sons? Because Ham is trying to create an illegitimate heir to the family. So Noah is pronouncing, nope, no way. This is not going to happen. That child is cursed to be the servant of my legitimate children. It just kind of makes sense to see it that way. And that's, that's why I think the mention of Canaan, because it says Ham was the father of Canaan, and, and it reiterates it. Right after that, it says it twice in the scriptures that we looked at. To me, that's pretty strong evidence to suggest what's going on. It explains, A, why Noah would see, how would he see if he was passed out drunk and something happened to him? You know, I mean, sure, we can use our imagination, <laughs> okay? But also, too, why would Ham go outside and tell his brothers? To me, this is starting to, we're building a character around Ham and the type of person that maybe Ham was. He goes in there, performs this act of maternal incest, and then goes out and tells his brothers that I've just done this thing, and he's bragging about it. And, you know, his brothers want to separate themselves from this act entirely. And that's why they go in backwards, and they toss the blanket on their dad, and they just, they just remove themselves from the situation. You know, I get it. We can interpret these things a lot of ways, but I think this makes a ton of sense when you're considering Canaan. Okay. And yes, Canaan becomes the son of the Canaanites, right? The, the people that Israel go in to displace. 
people like the Amorites and stuff like that. These are all Canaanites. These all come from this particular child, Canaan, who is a descendant of Ham. So it's a really interesting thing. And like I said, I wanted to take a stop along the way because I wanted to kind of paint the type of family that is being portrayed even before Nimrod comes into play in the picture. This would be his grandfather. Okay. So from there, we can go on and we can learn a little bit more about the descendants of Ham. So let's take a look at that now. Oh, and real quick before we move on, if you guys want to dive into this a little bit more, again, I recommend Dr. Heiser a lot. There's an episode of his pod podcast called The Naked Bible Podcast. No pun intended there. Uh, it's episode 159, and he discusses this exact event. And he'll break it down in more depth and better than I ever could. So if you want to go check that out, it's The Naked Bible Podcast, episode 159. So immediately after this event, in Genesis chapter 10, we get what is referred to as the Table of Nations. And it goes on to list out Noah's sons and their sons and sons and kind of how this all breaks down and some of it of where they went on to live. And it's in this list that we see Nimrod mentioned for the first time. And now I'm not going to go through this list because if I did, I would probably butcher most of the names that are there. And I think it would just kind of get confusing. But let me give you a little breakdown of kind of, you know, what's in this list. So from Japheth, we get a list of 14. From Ham, there's a list of 30. And from Shem, there's a list of 26. But what's interesting here is the order in which they give them. Instead of naming them in the order of the birth of the sons, it, it kind of reverses that, which is a little bit indicative of kind of how they were already viewing Ham in light of all these events to kind of say he's the least of the sons, in effect, by the way they structure the verses and the list and things of that nature. An interesting note here, this is where we get the term Semitic peoples. It's all of the list of families that are descended from Shem that are considered the Semitic peoples and the Semitic languages and things of that nature. That's where this term comes from, and it refers back to this little breakdown of the table of nations. So in total, there are 70 nations that are listed here. And I want to just make a quick asterisk here, guys. When we talk about these stories and the verbiage that's used, the whole world, the entire all peoples, this, these, this kind of all-encompassing language. I'm not going to pretend to understand how these ancient people viewed their world, okay? And I'm not going to get into this big defense of, you know, was it the entire world and how this all breaks down. That's not the place for this. This episode is not the place for that. Um, but I just want to say that, like, how they viewed the world is different from how we view the world. And again, this is the human element of the Bible, and it's okay for people to write from their perspective. And if we don't understand this verse or we try to place things into this verse in this story that it's maybe not saying or at least doesn't claim, you know, there's some projections that happen here that we just I want to be mindful of and I want to be kind of careful because I know they're there. I know that there are some people who would probably listen to this and have these arguments or, you know extremely polarizing different views on this story. I'm, we're just approaching it from academic scriptural level at this time right now. It's something that I'm okay to get into and talk about and discuss later because, again, I don't mind that there's a debate that rages around these things. And I just want to give it the right place to talk about it. But I just kind of want to give a acknowledgement that I know that we're talking about something that is highly and hotly debated as to what these people, groups, and lists means and what it means in scripture. You'll see some of the phrasing that's coming up here just a little bit when we get into the story of the Tower of Babel. And when we get there, I just want you guys to just kind of relax a little bit. We're looking at scripture. You know, I believe scripture. I believe scripture is inspired, but we're just not going to get into the nitty gritty of some of the things that people claim about this particular story. So just something to be mindful of as we move ahead. So even though we're not going to go into the entirety of the table of nations found in Genesis chapter 10, I do want to hone in on the verses that have to do with Ham and Cush and Nimrod so we can see where this figure comes from. So let's go into Genesis chapter 10, verse 6. And again, I'm back in the NASB. It says, The sons of Ham were Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba and Havilah and Sabta and Ra'amah and Sebteca, and the sons of Ra'ama were Sheba and Dedan. 
Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and rehoboth Ir and Kala and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. There is a whole lot happening in that <laughs> those few scriptures right there and a lot to break down. Honestly, the whole chapter is kind of that way. It It's such a foundational piece for understanding the cultures and the geographical setting for what plays out, man, throughout the entire Old Testament. But it's a great history lesson and one that I'll probably get into sometime, but it's way too much to try to digest in one episode. And that's why we're focusing particularly on these things. But it's a fantastic study if you invest the time just to kind of go in and understand who these people groups are and where they come from. So we saw we had Ham and then we had Cush. And what's kind of interesting in these genealogies is when something is kind of listed out in a unique way, people take notice because they know that the Hebrew writers have certain ways of doing things and certain ways of drawing your attention to something. And it can be done very quickly. It doesn't need to be this long, drawn out thing like the verse on the Nephilim, right? You just get this verse in Genesis 6 where it's like, oh, and the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, you know, and then it says what happened and then it just moves on in the story. But anyone that's kind of paying attention is like, wait, what did you just say? That's kind of how these verses are right here. Uh, maybe not as loaded as the Nephilim scripture in Genesis 6, but there's still these kind of things. And one of these things that people kind of hone in on is how it, it talks about Cush and all these other sons. And then kind of separately, there's this other verse that is kind of specifically mentions Nimrod. And it's not just like in this clear, concise list, right? It feels kind of disjointed in the way, you know, in verse eight, it says, after it lists everybody else out, it says, now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. It's perfectly fine to say that maybe Nimrod was just the, the youngest and it's just kind of how these things get listed out. But people do zero in on these things and they kind of read into them a little bit. And I'm not saying they're wrong. It's just that that's all the scripture says, you know, but you'll see people kind of expand upon this to be like, oh, we'll see, those were the original sons. And Nimrod is just, he's something else, right? What is Nimrod, right? So anytime you go down these rabbit trails, you'll kind of start to see some of these theories pop up. And that's where they start to take some of these. It's the structure of what's happening in the verses. Um, but the one that I particularly want to zero in in this is the language that we do see. And if you were tracking with us in the last episode, this is going to kind of piggyback off of that. And hopefully as I read it, maybe you started to notice a couple of words in there. Were there any particular words that you noticed? The one that should have kind of risen up inside of you is mighty. Because if you remember, we talked about in Genesis 6, how it says these were the mighty ones of old, the men of renown, men of valor, right? And that term was gibor or gibberim, plural. That's the same word that we see used here for Nimrod. So because there's this association in Genesis 6 with the Nephilim and Giborim, they're kind of jumping into this verse with that context in mind. And I'm not saying they're wrong, but what I am saying is that Gibor and Giborim, it's a term that means mighty and it means champion. Some people say it means tyrant, but when you look at these usage, more often than not, it's like it's hero, it's champion, it's, it's all these things. But what is interesting and what I do think is worth notating if you guys remember talking about the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Greek Old Testament. You know, so you had the, the Hebrews that were selected to translate it into Greek. And in the Septuagint, it uses instead of mighty, it uses the word gigantus, which is giant. So the Septuagint literally reads that he was a giant. He became a giant hunter before the Lord. That's what the Septuagint read. And I think that's important because it can kind of give us this insight, at least into how the ancient peoples were looking at and viewing and reading these scriptures. And now if you do dig into the extra biblical literature, particularly from the Second Temple Jewish period and kind of how some of the rabbis taught in some of these things, you will certainly find some references to Nimrod being a giant as well. But think of that kind of like how you can think of modern day teaching. Think about how modern day teaching kind of varies 
Uh, it's, a, I think, a lot more pronounced nowadays than it would have been in ancient times, but you still would have had these kind of divisions of interpretation within the culture. It's not like every single Hebrew person read and interpreted the scriptures the same way. These rabbis had commentaries and interpretations and all these things, just like we do today. So just because you find something in that second temple time period that says these things, it's insight, right? It's insight to how they thought and understanding how they thought is a very helpful thing when studying scripture because it gives you insight into what the people's mindset would have been and how they would have read things because chances are a lot of them would have heard these teachings, right? So just how things get passed on now, that's how the culture would have passed them on in their time as well. So I, I do find it interesting that the Septuagint does render mighty as giant in these scriptures. It's something just to kind of file away and just, again, take notice of, make a little note of, a little post-it note, if you will, because Context is important. And I think Nimrod in particular is one of these characters where I think you can make a case for the use of giant, uh, even though Gibor is still saying a mighty man. Again, these are idioms, right? So it's kind of hard to know what the context that they're trying to portray is in this. But I think it's interesting. So just, just some ideas, some scholarly things that you'll find in research you know, talking about these sort of things, but was Nimrod a giant? I think that's kind of the, the question at hand here. And really, I would say possibly, you know, what does it mean for the Septuagint to say he became a giant hunter? Man, your interpretation is as good as mine, right? I think that what we'll understand when we get into the, the, the story of what's happening, that it's not a good thing in this scenario to describe Nimrod as a mighty hunter. I don't think Given the family history and given the narrative that follows that Nimrod is ever painted in the, the Hebrew mind as a good man, because you will see this in some, you know, stuff outside of the Bible, they will describe him as a godly man. And again, there's a lot of things that have a perspective that are not in the Bible that will certainly not line up with the Bible. You'll see this since we're kind of talking about Babel and Babylon, you know, there are some things in the Babylonian scriptures or stories and tales and history that, you know, some parts line up with God and other parts don't line up with God, you know, and so you can never really trust those things. And you see this in the stories with Daniel, right? There's these kind of elements of like Nebuchadnezzar and all these things that happen where you're like, okay, like what's going on in Babylon? It's like, it's almost like they get it, but they don't get it sometimes. And I think that could be said of many of the cultures that surround Israel is that there are these dovetailing of cultures. And it's not like it's a giant distance between these. these cultures would have had a lot of mingling and things in common. And I think it's okay to see certain elements, but you can't really trust their narratives. In my opinion, you can't trust their narratives. And that's kind of what this series is about. Like, what are these nations into and what are they getting into and why is God opposed to them? And why does God call Israel and what makes Israel different from the surrounding nations? That's what all this is about. So another little side tangent, it's hard not to get on these little trails when, when you talk about these sort of things, because it's all so loaded. It's also foundational to understanding what is playing out in future stories in the Bible. So let's move ahead. Let's get into Genesis chapter 11, where the story of the Tower of Babel actually takes place. And let's see what all of this is happening with some of these things kind of floating in our mind as we go into the setting. Because again, it helps to bring context, right? And context, as we know, is important. So Genesis chapter 11, I'm in the New American Standard, starting with verse one. I'm going to read a lot of scripture. This is one of those scripture heavy episodes. So just hang in there. I'll try to be as clear as I can and, you know, Put on my narrator voice. So Genesis chapter 11, starting with verse one. Now the whole earth, no, I'm just kidding. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. 
a quick note on Shinar. So just pause at verse two. Uh, this would be in like Eastern Mesopotamia, uh, modern day Eastern Iraq, it, you know, kind of like in the Southern part of what would have been Mesopotamia, just to kind of give you some geographical location. Back into verse three. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, behold, they are one people. And they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing that they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth. And they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel or Babel because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. So here we can see that we have Nimrod. And just a little side note, Nimrod's name means we shall rebel or to rebel. Basically, it means rebellion, <laughs> which is very interesting considering what's going on at Babel. Because if you remember when Noah came out of the ark, they were told by God to, hey, go out and multiply to, to replenish the earth. Okay, but they start to congregate. They say that we need to make a name for ourselves. Why would they have this mentality? Why would there be this family, right? That, hey, we need to make a name for ourselves. I think that there's something that comes into play with what transpired with Ham and Noah that's playing a little bit into the mentality of these people of which Nimrod is king. And I also think it's kind of interesting to note that like Nimrod was the king and, you know, in ancient times, the king would declare this is built, but it's almost like they're of one mind to do this whole thing. I'm just kind of reading into this. These are just things that kind of come off the page and come alive to me as I read these things. And I just think it's interesting that they all kind of had this one purpose. And, and what is it that they're trying to do, right? Because I think as a kid, this story to me was always kind of portrayed as they were built, they were going to build like the build, the, the first skyscraper, right? Like this was going to be massive. Now, this thing was a ziggurat. It, it's pretty well- I think documented that this was a ziggurat, a typical temple tower worship setting that they were building in this. Okay. And when it uses the phrase, like whose height will reach to heaven. Remember we were talking about before when the children of Israel were coming into the land of Canaan to fight, they said that the cities were fortified unto heaven. And how I talked about what that meant was that these cities were protected by deities. And so when we look at this, the purpose of what they're building is something that will reach into heaven, I think, and what a lot of other people think too. I'm, I'm not unique in this. I'm just kind of letting you know when something is my personal belief versus something that I'm kind of laying out academically. Personally, I am of the opinion of what is happening here is that these people are trying to get into heaven illegitimately, Okay. We do know from scripture that there are kind of multiple levels of heaven. You know, Paul talks about going to the third heaven. And we've discussed a little bit how in the heavenly realms, there is this corruption and how that corruption isn't going to be in the highest heaven with God. It has to be kind of somewhere in between. However many levels there might be, some of them have corruption. And I think personally that they're trying to get something that would accomplish maybe what was happening before the flood a way to get back because I think the flood has created a problem with how these people think and their religion. You know, it's known that some of Noah's sons took wives from other cultures that would have been from Nephilim tribes. And it's entirely possible that one of these mothers passed down this religious system to her sons. It's it's completely possible. Anyway, or their grandchildren. So these things begin to permeate the world again after the flood. These religions, these thought processes, these rebellions are starting to happen again. So we have the initial fall and rebellion that happens in the garden. We had the incursion of the angelic forces, which brought 
the flood. And now we have humans kind of trying to reach back out again, it seems to me. They're building this tower and this structure that kind of catches God's attention. And he comes down and he's like, let's see what these guys are up to. And this has to be frustrating, right? Like, God swears that he won't destroy the entire earth again, right? He places the rainbow in the sky as that covenant that he would never destroy the earth by flood ever again. So not very long after this, just a couple of generations later, we're almost back at the same spot again. But this time, instead of the angelic incursion, now it's being initiated by humans. And they're creating this temple structure to access something in the heavenly realm. And, you know, God looks at it and says, they will be able to do this. Essentially, he says, this will work. What they're trying to do is work. It's going to work. And anything they imagine to do after this, it won't be held back. Like, they'll, they'll be able to accomplish it. That's a Think about that statement for a second. What these people were trying to do would have succeeded. And who knows what the consequences would have been if they would have succeeded. And so you got to think of Nimrod. He is the ringleader of this very thing, this mighty man, this hunter before the Lord. Like this man had a reputation in heaven. Okay. And that's why I say, I don't think that it's a very positive one because of what he's trying to accomplish right here. And so that's kind of the end of the narrative for Babel right now. But what we see later on is these events get referenced again. And particularly when the children of Israel leave Egypt after the Exodus, they're coming back into this land. Okay. And now this land is full. When I say this land, I don't, you know, obviously there was Israel, but there were all these nations were kind of scattered throughout this land. And most of them came from, well, I guess all of them really came from, you know, Canaan or this line of Ham. Okay. And so what you'll find later on when the Israelites come up against these cultural identity has taken root everywhere. What started in Babel took root and was carried on throughout all these cultures, even after they were scattered. So these people get scattered, right? And they go and they, they start their own nations. Their, their languages get confused, uh, but they take what was happening with them, you know, but this is where we start to see the introduction of possibly lots of other different languages in the area. And that's where, as you study some of these things that happen, things will start to have different names, right? And that's what we're talking about with things like Rephaim. Rephaim kind of gets translated or they're referred to by different cultures, by different names as you go into each particular one, the Amorites versus the Amalekites versus the Moabites, all the Hittites, all these kind of cultures in that area have these different names for how they refer to some of these things. So it takes some study to kind of see the nuance of what's happening in some of the language and story through some of these other things, because you now have this overlaying and dividing up of languages. But one thing kind of that references this event later on is in Deuteronomy. And you guys, Deuteronomy is loaded. There are so many things that are pivotal and foundational in Deuteronomy. I know it kind of gets these reputations as one of these books that's kind of boring and, you know, kind of one of these law ish books, but man, there are some very important references in Deuteronomy that really help shed light and bring perspective to so many different things and events throughout the Bible. So I want to go into Deuteronomy chapter 32 with verse seven and kind of look at how this was referenced. So again, NASB starting in verse seven, remember the days of old, consider the years of all generations, ask your father and he will inform you your elders and they will tell you When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set boundaries for the people according to the number of the sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. Remember, this was the verse that we talked about in the Dead Sea Scrolls episode where what gets translated right here is the sons of Israel. The Dead Sea Scrolls kind of helps us see because they had multiple copies preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls of Deuteronomy. And they all said, (laughs) according to the number of the sons of God, according to the number of the B'nai Elohim. And so that's what kind of brought this verse into light when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, because it doesn't really make any sense. As far as this division and this reference when God divided up the people, it's referencing the Tower of Babel. That's the only frame of reference that we have for that language is 
and there's other things to talk about it too, as identifying the division at and the confusion at Babel that is the thing that's being referenced here in Deuteronomy 32. But since it's saying in the Dead Sea Scrolls, an older text, that the nations were divided according to the number of the sons of God, according to the number of the B'nai Elohim. That is such a big deal. And it's very important to understanding the context and the setting of everything that comes after Babel. Because what happens is when God comes down, he sees what's happening and he essentially divorces mankind. He hands mankind and these nations over to be ruled and governed by other lower, lesser, little g gods, Elohim. Okay, he allots the nations to their rule. Okay, and if you remember when we talked about in the Sons of God episode, when judgment is being passed upon the Elohim, because they are, they're, they're conducting injustice in the land. They're not ruling the way that they should rule. And God, is, he sentences them to death. Well, that division and that rule is what happens at Babel. And that is what Deuteronomy 32 is referencing when God divided the nations according to the number of the sons of God, according to the number of the B'nai Elohim. So it's really important to understand that setting in that context of what transpires after the Tower of Babel. These people get confused and they get split up and they become nations that take root in this area. You know, and it's not just that, it's the entire world. This is how the Gentile nations are created. Up until this point, God's just kind of wrestling with men, trying to get them to follow and listen to him. And he's trying to kind of bring men back into relationship. You know, after Eden, it just, as it's unraveling, and then after the flood, he's trying to start over and reboot this thing and keep it on track and doing all this stuff. And then at Babel, God finally says, like, look, it's just the, the thoughts of his, of man's heart are continually evil to, to borrow from phrases before the flood. You know, he just sees that here we go again. Fine, fine. You want this? This is what you want? You can have it. And isn't that true of God to do that? When we desire something, even if it's bad for us, if we are persistent in pursuing it, God will allow us to have even something that will destroy us. And he divorces the nations in that moment when he passes judgment at Babel and the Gentile nations are created, you know, in, in context and in concept, you know, they, they are separated from God. And right after this, we go into the story of how God chooses Abram, who is Abraham. He chooses this man and he removes the idols and he removes all these things. And he says, this will be my portion. Israel will be my portion. They will be my inheritance and they will be my allotment. And from there, we have the setting that plays out the rest of the way, really to this very day. Obviously, the cross is a huge deal in all this because this opens the floodgates for the Gentiles. Well, the gate, the one floodgate, the floodgate of Jesus' blood for the Gentile nations to come back, to no longer be divorced, to no longer be separated. You know, there was a way to allow Gentiles to, to come into covenant with Israel and kind of come under the law and agree to live with all those things. But as a whole, these nations were not accepted. Well, now they are. The cross has massive implications on fixing this situation. But at this point of the story, this is, this is the great divorce right here. This is God saying, nope, you are no longer my inheritance. You are no longer under me. You are now going to be under these lesser gods, which you were pursuing anyway, fine. You want them, you can have them, and it does not go well for them. They are not treated well. And from there, the, the deception of the corrupt B'nai Elohim just gets spread. Okay, and that's why I think personally in these nations throughout the world, you see these similarities between the religions. You see these pantheons, you see these gods, and they have similar names and similar roles, and, and you can just... You know, you can just look at it. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the similarities be between these different religions. Now, obviously, they will vary because at, you know how it goes when people get separated and they get isolated. The stories over time, they will morph and they will change and all these things. But I think that we do see kind of a centralized story that spreads through these other cultures throughout the world because 
you can find references to the flood, to, you know, one man being saved with his family in multiple cultures, even in Native American cultures, even in South American cultures. There's all of these things kind of tell a similar story, not the same story, but they tell a similar story. And I think that's very interesting. But I think that's also why we see these commonalities between religions throughout the world. I mean, the entire world, especially what you see in ancient cultures. Now, obviously, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are a little bit different because these all branch from Abraham. And to be honest with you, I kind of consider Christianity and Judaism the same thing, right? It's, Christianity is just the progression of Judaism. And I think in the end, in the end, as in the end times, it all becomes the same anyway, right? When, when the Jewish people come into a realization that, oh, this is our Messiah. You'll see that Judaism and Christianity just end up in the same place in truth. So anyway, sorry, just kind of a thought there. But yeah, that's why this setting is so important. It's why what happens at the Tower of Babel is so important. And, you know, the Tower of Babel, Nimrod is kind of like Melchizedek. If you guys don't know who Melchizedek is, uh, when you get into the story of Abraham, he basically goes, he fights these kings, he wins, and on his way back, this mysterious priest, the priest of Salem, comes out, whose name is Melchizedek. And Abraham tithes to Melchizedek. He gives him 10% of all of the plunder from the war that he just won. And that's the only mention of Melchizedek. There becomes prophecies about Jesus being after the order of Melchizedek later, later on with David. But what, I, what I'm trying to say there is there's just this little mention of Melchizedek and it becomes this figure that kind of like prophesies Jesus because there was very little scripture about it, but it became part of the culture. The idea of Melchizedek and what happened with Abraham became so foundational that it influenced so many things. In Jewish culture, Nimrod is kind of the same way. It's this prototype figure that kind of enters into the story. And Nimrod kind of takes the place of the, if Melchizedek is this foreshadowing of, of Jesus, then Nimrod becomes this foreshadowing of the Antichrist. He is the anti-king, right? He is, he is the ruler that is not a ruler of peace. He is he is the ruler that tries to take heaven. He tries to ascend into heaven. He tries to illegitimately get access to things. And he unites, quote unquote, the whole world into one kingdom and one mind and all these things. And so you kind of that's you can see how that plays out, right? With him being this antichrist figure and prototype. With that thought in mind, I kind of want to go forward and I want to finish today's episode with a couple of cryptic prophecies that to me just kind of hit a little bit different when you have this framework and when you see things like Nimrod in this light and just kind of what's happening in Genesis in general in the way that we've been talking about it. And the first one I want to go to is Micah. And this is going to be chapter five, starting in verse one. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us. With a rod, they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Let's go, Jesus. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel, and he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord of his God, and they will remain. Because at that time, he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace when the Assyrian invades our land, when he tramples our citadels. Then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight leaders of men. They will shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod at its entrances. And he will deliver us from the Assyrian when he attacks our land and when he tramples our territory. So this is... Micah is obviously prophesying about the coming doom of Israel when Assyria is going to be invading them. But what he does is he, the, the prophecy hyperlinks ahead to Jesus, and it talks about Bethlehem. This is the scripture when Jesus is born that the, the wise men are talking about that the Messiah should be born in Bethlehem. You know, this is where that idea, this prophecy came from. It's why Jesus had to be born there. So it's, it's very interesting that even though he's talking about the coming invasion of the Assyrians, he links it to the rescue of the Messiah. And then he also 
kind of hyperlinks Assyria, the land of Nimrod, right? So it's kind of like this, this anti-God thing is coming against Israel as a judgment because Israel has transgressed and they have forsaken God and they've done all these wicked things before God. And so God is sending upon them the Assyrians, but he's also promising to send the Messiah as well. But that nation, that vessel is hyperlinked to Nimrod because he could just say the Assyrians, right? But it's, he's so infamous that even in this time, later on in Israel's history, they still reference Assyria as the land of Nimrod. That should tell you how infamous this character was. Um, and lastly, let's go to Jeremiah chapter five. And we're going to start in verse 12 in the NASB. They have all lied about the Lord and said, not he, misfortune will not come upon us and we will not see sword or famine. The prophets are as wind and the word is not in them. Thus it will be done to them. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth fire and this people would, and it will consume them. Behold, I am bringing a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. It is an enduring nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open grave. All of them are mighty men. They will devour your harvest and your food. They will devour your sons and your daughters. They will devour your flocks and your herds. They will devour your vines and your fig trees. They will demolish with sword your fortified cities in which you trust. Man, cryptic indeed. You know, what I find interesting about that is the repetition of devour because when the spies for Israel went in to spy out the land before the conquest of Canaan, they said that the land was one that devoured its people. And I just, to me, that hyperlinks, right? We have this pronounced judgment that God is going to send these mighty men, right? There's just all this rich reference and terminology. And hopefully when you read scripture, this is what I mean about the lens, right? Yeah, it's talking about Gibor, right? Mighty men, Gibberim, right? It's not saying Nephilim. It's not saying any of those things. It's saying Gibberim. But with the context, you start to see all these other things that come into play, that there just is this richness to the symbolism that the Bible employs. And that's why these concepts are important to me. That's why this series has been important to me. And you know what, guys? I think for now we found a place that we're going to land this plane because I think we've done a good job through these, all these episodes of building and establishing this framework. And I hope that as we're reading these scriptures, that's why I've kind of started to go into scriptures that have a little more nuance into them to kind of show you that, hey, when you're reading, these things kind of start to come to life in a different way. That there are these deep, rich references that are there in layers, if you will, layers upon layers that you will start to see, you know? So hopefully as you guys are reading scripture and we have these discussions, you'll see where I'm tracking and I hope it started to make sense for you guys. Thank you so much for sticking with me on this series. I kept trying to go in a different direction, you know, and maybe it was God, maybe it was the spirit. I just, I kept feeling the thread pulling me in this way. And I know these are heavy Bible study type episodes, and I really appreciate you guys listening. I love scripture, and I hope you love scripture too. I also love ancient history and religion and all these things. I told you I could have been an archaeologist. I guess in my way, I'm cosplaying archaeology here with you guys on the, on the mic. But thank you again for tracking with me. You guys, if you have any questions or if you have any comments, if there's scriptures that have come to you that you've noticed, hey, I would love to kind of dig into them with you. Feel free to hit me up. You know where to find me online. You can always email me on the website, www.faithandfringe.com. You can hit me over on Twitter. I, I'm on Twitter a good bit. I use Instagram a little bit, but I use Twitter a little bit more. <laughs> so I, I'm definitely there, but you can find me over at Faith and Fringe Twitter and you can find me at FAF Podcast on Instagram. There's the Facebook all those things. Guys, you can hit me up anywhere. I'm more than happy to take the time when I can to dive into some of this stuff. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed putting it together. It's been a challenge. I've really had to kind of dust off the old books. You know, some of the stuff I went through in seminary over 10 years ago. So I've had to revisit some of the things that I was studying back then. And it's been a great experience to kind of revisit these with all of you guys. 
I love you so much as always. Thank you so much for sitting through this and I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's helped you guys to see scripture for the the beauty that it is because I think it's truly beautiful and interesting and just fantastic. Um, I love you guys. Hope you have a good day. I'll see you next time. Peace.